So we're going to start off here. Uh, just real quick, my background, two second slide. I worked in Trustwave Spider Labs. I'm the Mod Security Project Leader. Uh, some other organizations I work with, and shameless plug for my upcoming book, Web Application Defender Cookbook, coming out later this year. Greg. And uh, my name is Greg Wobletsky, and I'm a, a certified ethical hacker. <laughs> and uh, I work for Microsoft. And uh, uh, I work at Microsoft Security Response Center. And uh, I do different uh, kind of security research. All right, so real quick before we jump into mod security and the new um, versions that we have, we just wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page as far as why do you need something like mod security, right? What is it useful for? Um, so looking at web-based vulnerabilities, that's one of the things we do in Trustwave Spider Labs. Uh, we do web assessments, pen tests, code reviews. We find vulnerabilities. So once your organization knows you have vulnerabilities in your web apps, what are you going to do about it? So then you shift to remediation. Hopefully, you have access to source code developers and all that stuff, and you can fix it in the code. That's the way you should do it. Um, however, we're finding there's a lot of different scenarios where, depending on the application, you maybe have some constraints, and you can't actually do that. Um, so we actually took a survey. This was through OWASP to figure out people that are using virtual patching that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, why are you using that? And these are some different responses for, again, it depends on the application, but why you can't actually go in and fix the code. So for some reasons, it could be it's third-party outsource code. You know, it's a black box, essentially. Or your developers have moved on to another project, so you actually don't have them to fix it. You'd have to reallocate them. Also, contractual language is a big problem where you know, the outsourced code, they were contracted to fix the vulnerability, or to write the code according to the specification. If you find security defects, that really wasn't covered. So look at, looking at this slide, if you're following the dots, right, you have these vulnerabilities, you can't fix them in the code, what do you think is going to happen? That means you're going to get uh, hacked, right? So this is another project that we run at the Web Application Security Consortium, WASP, uh, called the Web Hacking Incident Database, where we track real-world web compromises. So we're not looking at vulnerabilities. We're seeing at the end goal, which is an application did actually get hacked, and then how did they do it? So this is just a real high-level view of putting it into two different categories. Why are people hacking these applications to begin with? So on the left side, you have profit-driven hackers. You know, they're looking to make money, of course. The right side is hacktivism. So just tying those all together, I know this is the uh, TurboTalk view, so we're running through it quick, but obviously you got to fix these vulnerabilities somehow. So that moves into why mod security. Why is it such a popular tool? Um, so really, this is a, a key point that we want to bring up specifically for this talk and also for why Trustwave and Microsoft uh, MSRC joined together for this, this project. And that is virtual patching as a process. Okay, virtual patching is different. It's not quote unquote WAF. Right, where you're buying an appliance or a box and it does a lot of things automatically. Virtual patching, this is a definition we have uh, that we created from OWASP. So the key point is here is that you have to know about a vulnerability. That's where it starts. And then you figure out how to go back and do some remediation efforts. Okay, so mod security, why is it such a great tool for this? Um, uh, it's been around for a decade now, right? It's, it's well tested. Uh, protecting millions of websites, we really don't have a lot of metrics on the actual number of installs. That's kind of hard for us to track. We can track source code downloads. Uh, and you can see there we've had over 275,000 downloads of the source code. Um, lots of good uh, feature set, which comes in real handy for doing virtual patches that we'll show. And also the licensing being open source, uh, ASL v2. All right. So uh, you know, probably you know, you have seen why Apache is, uh, is so good. and. Uh, uh, but the problem was that Apache was good, uh, the mod security was good uh, on Apache. So, but what about the other platforms? And the most recent statistics show that uh, Apache covers maybe about 60% uh, of the servers uh, and, and even less domains that are served out there. Uh, so what about, what about the rest? And that's why we, we thought that uh, it would be a great idea to bring mod security to uh, IIS and NG, NGINX because uh, with that coverage, we would be able to cover more than 90% of, of the internet. Uh, and uh, and the, there are many advantages of this approach. The one, one which is kind of obvious is that you could use a, a single protection layer uh, in the form of, of mod security uh, configuration files 
uh, to your entire data center or uh, entire web farm, uh, covering all the servers that you have. And uh, although you know the, the the way you include the uh, because the platforms are very different, so the way you include the configuration file is different. The configuration itself, the protection logic that you define, it's one and, and the same. Uh, so on IIS, the, the, the mod security experience is, is slightly different than on Apache. Uh, you start with a typical uh, Windows installer, you install it on, on the Windows server, and then after installation you have to add it to your, uh, to your configuration file. Uh, and usually it's much bigger than on this example. Uh, and uh, then uh, you recycle the, the application pool and then you have it running. And you see in the, in the Windows Server event log that, that the mod, mod security was loaded. Uh, on Nginx, uh, it's yet another experience because, like I said, the, the platforms are very different. Uh, so you have to compile, uh, uh, compile mod security into a library. And then NG Nginx does not, does not let uh, modules being loaded uh, during runtime, so you have to compile your, your own uh, Nginx binary with mod security. And then you are ready to go. Uh, once you add the mod security configuration file in your uh, Nginx config file, uh, you, you will see in the Nginx log that, that the module was loaded and it's ready to go. Uh, so, so Ryan mentioned about uh, why are we doing this and about the virtual patching. So uh, how, we have a few, uh, two examples of how, how the virtual patching with mod security can be used on IIS. And the first example is a vulnerability from uh, December 2011. And it was a collision in, uh, in hash table uh, in ASP.NET uh, component of the server. And uh, with just a one megabyte big payload uh, sent to the server, an attacker could, could uh, make uh, 30,000 cores uh, busy using uh, one gigabit of, of bandwidth. And uh, that was leading to a, to a serious denial of service condition. Uh, so uh, normally this, 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 was, this was fixed in a kind of, in a, in an emergency mode because, because the vulnerability was serious. Uh, but uh, without the fix, you could, you could, using mod security, you could protect yourself uh, using, using uh, different types of mitigations. And here are the four examples. And uh, the mod security had uh, rules created for all four of them. So uh, here I have an example of uh, one of the rules. It's, uh, it's a rule that detects uh, repetitive payload in IIS requests. Uh, and it, it's very complicated. It's, uh, it would be difficult to implement in, uh, in other like simple, uh, simple scanning tools. And when the rule is added to the configuration file and uh, the proof of concept attack that was published is launched, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the page access is blocked with access denied and this, this kind of event log is uh, is locked in the in the Windows Server uh, event log. Uh, so the second example is a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability that was patched in July, and it's it's a typical reflected cross-site scripting where uh, under in certain uh, circumstances attacker could could just put a, a script in the uh, sections parameter of of the of the URL. And uh, it was very bad. It was, it was one of the most uh, critical web security vulnerabilities that can be because the attacker could run the, the code in the, uh, in the context of the user on the server and just still do everything that the user can do in, and, and more. So like still all the documents and, and everything else. And that's obviously is, is very bad. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the, the, there is a way. With most security, there is a way. Um, as opposed to the, the previous rules that we showed for the hash DOS, which is a little bit more non-traditional from a virtual patching perspective, if you want to take more of a traditional input validation, right, injection context, uh, two different approaches, right? You have blacklisting approach, which is looking for what's bad, what should not be there. So you can do that if you know in the sections parameter, like what, what's the payload supposed to be in the first place? 
or in this case, knowing if you're doing cross-site scripting, okay, the, the angle, you know, greater than, less than, tick marks, certain the parentheses, look for those things that shouldn't be there. So in the blacklisting approach, that's what we're doing up here at the top, essentially. I don't know if this is gonna work, if you can see my cursor here, right? So we wanna look for that specific uh, URL, and then we're looking only in the sections parameter, and then in this case, we're using a, a fast pattern match, so it's not a regular expression. It just says if you see any of those meta characters in there at all, that's a match. So you can go that route, blacklisting approach. Now it's not quite as strong as you'd like it to be from an input validation perspective. Ideally, you do wanna know what is sections parameter supposed to have? Like is it supposed to be digits? What's it supposed to be? So that's optionally down here, the whitelisting approach. The beginning is exactly the same. You're looking in the same injection point, but then down here, uh, if you've never really looked at mod security rules or looked at them that much, um, here we are doing a regular expression. We do some anchoring to make sure that it only contains, uh, you know, word characters. So alphanumeric, I think like underscore, things like that. Now the reason why this is a whitelisting approach is with the mod security syntax, if you put the exclamation point at the beginning, that, mean, that inverts the logic. So what you wanna do in a regular expression is define what should have been there in the code in the first place, right? What the developer should have been doing. And in this case, you just say, if it's not this, that's a problem. Do, do, do. Uh, so typical event log now, so you can see all that stuff funnels there so you can get all your events and see which stuff is triggered. Okay, so uh, mod security 2.7.0. Uh, we have release candidate version two out right now, so we've been testing certain things with it. Uh, in mod security, like the core itself, but then also with these new versions for IIS and Nginx. So 2.7.0 is the first multi-platform uh, supported version that we have. Uh, you can go download it today. If you go out, it's currently hosted on our SourceForge uh, repository. Uh, so the top URL is where you get to the regular mod security source code. If you're only an IIS user and you just want to grab the MSI and install it, got the link down there at the bottom, you can do that. Turn it back to Greg. And uh, from the Microsoft perspective, we, uh, we expect to, to use mod security in the, our uh, response process. Uh, as you can imagine, the, 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 the uh, availability of mod security for IIS give us a uh, possibility to, to publish uh, rules that would, that would let, let our customers be uh, protected from uh, any vulnerabilities that are being uh, either uh, disclosed uh, to us or uh, disclosed publicly. And we also expect that uh, the, a community work will, will start on creating uh, the rules that will be specific to, to ASP, ASP.NET, and IIS uh, environment. So, uh, summarizing, we, we have the mod security has entered a new, new, uh, new stage. Uh, we, have, uh, we have it available on three platforms. Uh, uh, we encourage you to to learn more about this, about the effort. Uh, you can even look at the source code. It's right now it's in the experimental branch uh, on, the, on the SourceForge. And uh, we will publish uh, uh, blogs about the release uh, tomorrow. And uh, then there are a number of people who contributed to the effort. Uh, so uh, you could find some of those people, uh, actually most of those people, you can find them here at the Black Hat. Uh, this year, and uh, we have one more thing coming. All right, yeah, so because this was a turbo talk, obviously we couldn't do all of the demonstrations that we would have liked to. Uh, fortunately, we did get some slots in Arsenal. So if you know where the Arsenal area is, at 3.30 today, we're gonna be there for an hour and also tomorrow at 10.15. So if you do wanna come by, see Mod Security as a whole, or wanna see some of these different versions, stop by, Q&A, see some more demos. And I think that's it, so thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. We are Matias Katz and Maximiliano Soler. We are talking about HGT exploit and how to bypass the HGT access restrictions. Come on. This one? Okay. Matias Katz, see if you want to introduce yourself. Oh, right. Okay. Matias Cassi is a penetration testing, has a company named MKIT Argentina. Um, 
is specializes in web application security, uh, also do penetration testing. Me, Maximiliano Soler, uh, I live in Buenos Aires, I work for a bank uh, as security analyst. Okay, basic concept. This is for introduce everything and everyone to the basic concept. Um, HTT access is hypertext access and basically is a configuration file to uh, win directives that is to use to configure H directory or files, for example. You can use the HTT access to redirection, uh, URL redirection, and directory listing protection, URL rewriting, and authorization authentication. This is the main of this tag. Okay, why attack this type of protected uh, directory? The, the, the common uh, things to, to, to get are backups files, configurations, and updated versions, uh, new developments, because sometimes in, uh, we have uh, developers or admin, sysadmin that put all your backups in this protect uh, directory. The tool. The tool is naming HTT exploit and the meaning is hypertext access exploit. It's a tool written in Python that exploit a weakness in the in the way that HTT access are configuration. I can forget. Um, for example, you will be able to, with this tool to bypass this authentication process. The main features of this tool is free and open source. If you want, you can collaborate. It's user friendly, flexible, has a lot of um, modernizing. <coughs> it's integrating with major tools. In the next version, will be integrating with Nmap, um, Metasploit, and uh, has a, a funny report. We build in. Uh, this is an old weakness. It no, it's not now. It's no new. Sorry. Uh, we haven't uh, um, not having found currently exploited by other tools. A lot of websites um, recommending how to implement HTT access vulnerable and from fund and profit. <laughs> what is not HTT, HTT exploit? It's not a one, one click punish tool. It's not a replacement for other web having tools and it's not completely integrating with other tools. Okay. This is the common configuration for protect a uh, directory. Have you ever seen this type of configuration? Yeah? Okay. At the first line, this is the HTT pass WT. Out name, authentication basic. This will be others if you, if you want, could be, for example, dishes. 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 Um, this is the directive limit with get and post. Go ahead. Okay, we uh, have found a lot of university recommend this type of configuration. But this type of configuration are vulnerable or has a weakness. Demo. Okay, hi. Uh, we've, been asked, we, we've been in Arsenal uh, at 10 a.m. and people have come around our booth and asked us to show them the demo. And we have presented them with this HT access configuration. And we have been asking them if they would upload this HT access to their production servers. About 95% of the people that uh, saw this configuration said yes. This is very typical configuration for HT access because it, because it limits the methods available for uh, usage of the directory, just forget and post, so that you won't be able to perform an options or a trace or whatever. That's a very common, very typical, and very chosen configuration for HT access. 
Some people said, okay, maybe I wouldn't use basic, I would use digest. <clears throat> Somebody said, I won't use HTPASSWD because it's too standard, I would personalize the file, that's okay. Uh, it's, some said they would use TLS, that's okay too. That doesn't matter for this exploit. Even if you use digest, even if you change the, the, the password file, if in, even if you use uh, TLS, yeah, even if you use digest, even if it's only one valid user instead of any valid user, you would still be vulnerable. So, uh, many of these universities and also uh, uh, hosting providers and cloud providers and companies and our customers and whatever, they have all uh, recommended this type of HT access, this exact type of HT access. Uh, and this is a vulnerable HT access configuration. So. What stroke us down was that uh, about 95% of the websites available online were recommending users to use this kind of HD access. So I would encourage you to go check your servers if you're vulnerable or not after seeing this demo because a, huge, a high percentage of you will be vulnerable. So let's see the tool. I have a server here, it has a private directory which is protected. Of course, if I try to access it, it would go to the demo, of course. <laughs> okay, it asks for password. This site is, pro is protected by an HT access with a vulnerable one, so we can exploit it. So, what the tool does is quite simple. There it is. The tool is quite simple. It's written in Python, it's open source, we'll be publishing open source. Uh, it has many modules to, to charge. You, you can use the DECT module, which is the standards. That's what we're going to use. Uh, you can redirect the output to whatever you want. But the main, uh, the main parameter that you need to express is the URL. The URL is the only one required. That's the URL that you want to exploit. So in, that, in this case, we want to exploit the server that I just showed you. So we're going to use private, and let's set it to verbose mode. So what the tool will do is try to download index.php inside the same private directory. So that's private slash index.php. So it could download it. It, what, it, it, the, what the tool is showing is that the directory is exploitable. So what the tool can do now is yeah, perform what it's called a full scan. The full scan will take um, a word list that is provided with our tool, but you can use your own. And bear in mind, this is not a dictionary attack on the passwords. This is not a password cracking tool. The word list is just for files. What we have put here in the word list is the typical default uh, pages that are available in WordPress, Joomla, and whatever. And that's what we're relying on. You can use your own word list, and if you have a word list of 2,000 different forms, you can use it. But that, this, it's not a password cracking tool. Several people have told me that during Arsenal. It's not that. You're bypassing the authentication. So if we do that with the full list, and it starts the full scan. It will try to download each of the files in the word list. So we'll try to download, and at the end, it would say that 52 files were downloaded out of 750 with a 6% success rate. That means that 52 files from the server, from the protected directory server, have been downloaded to our computer. And now it's locally on our, on our server, or on, on our computer. But uh, the, the main functionality of this uh, tool is the link scanner module. The link scanner module will try to download, will download all the files and then read inside of them and search for links. And each time it checks for a link, it tries to download that site also from the server. So if I run the link detect scan module, I will run it. 
And for each one of them, it will show all of the links found. For instance, in article.php, we have found 23 links. Articles.php 11, index.php 11, and that's it. And after removing duplicates, we find 23 new links found. That's without knowing the internal structure of the site. That's without using the word list. The word list was, was just the first, the first step of the, of, the, of the process. Now the tool is reading from inside the server, from inside the, the, the directory, and checking for links and downloading that link, those links. So now that the 23 links were found, you can run a new thread of HT exploit with those new files and download those also by growing horizontally and trying to make the, the report, the final report bigger. So we're going to find, we're going to download those files and it check index PHP has been downloaded, blah, 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 external links are skipped, blah, 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 and there were seven new files downloaded out of 20 and now you can rerun the link detect scan on this new result. This is a recursive procedure that would end only when you have successfully downloaded each and every file on the server. And we recursively try again and try again and download and leak detect and download and leak detect until it's finished. So we're gonna do yes, he's gonna download and he, the tool found 66 new links. So we're gonna run a new HTX fluid thread to download those. And now the tool downloaded 59 more files. And now we're going to run a link to text scan. Now it found 619 new links. This, this, this uh, enables us to, to grow the, the, the size of the report, the final report. We're going to run a new HT exploit. Now it full scan completed. No new files are downloaded. That's means that we have successfully sucked everything from the server and we can go home happy. So 115 total files after four iterations and the report, the final report is right here. So if you open up that, open up the report directory and we have a nice HTML report that lists all the files found on the server. Those are the 114 files. Can't say what it says, 115 and shows 114, maybe a small bug. But if you access these files, you can access the actual information. Chocolate Dalmatian. And we access that. And that's it. So what are we looking at right here? The, the tool, the, the, the vulnerability in Apache only allows us to download PHP files. It won't download HTML, it won't download JPEG, it won't download style sheets. It only will download PHP files. So you won't get any fancy output. But you will get the data, which is the most important one, the most important part. We now have the entire content of the server that if we access it correctly, it's a nice coffee racks uh, site for maybe a, a local business or something and articles you can have all the articles and then there are all the types of coffee and this is the same information black eye.php we're gonna look for black eye black eye.php and that's exactly the same just without the, the graphics and the fonts and the styles and the whatever, but the data is on our computer right here. For each downloaded file, we get a local copy with all the information we need with a nice full report to show to our customers or whatever. Well, that's it. That's the demo. That's the demo. That's the demo. That's the demo. <laughs> Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah? Okay. The weakness. This is the most important part. The problem resides how to the HTTP requests are being limited. 
The following statement, for example, is limit get post, require valid user and limit. This indicate that only the only applies to get and post method. Uh, what happens if we generate another non-standard method? For example, potato. 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 Okay. When PHP, PHP receives the non-standard method, it process it like a get, downloading the request file. Solutions? The thing is that Apache can handle the, the methods that you have. Uh, the the, the, uh, yeah, the method that you have disabled, Apache can handle them. So, uh, but if you use a method that is not common to Apache, Apache will pass it along and send it to PHP and say, "Hey, PHP, maybe you know how to deal with this." That's how you bypass Apache. And then when PHP gets the request, if, PH, if PHP gets a request with a method that it doesn't know. It treats it like a get. So you bypass, you bypass the required valid user because you're not using neither get nor post. So it doesn't require valid user for those limits. So Apache sends it along directly, and then when PHP gets it, it treats it like a get, and you get the files. Go. Possible solutions improve the HTT access configuration. Apache model experimental and the PHP code. Okay. From the HET access configuration, you will be used, um, for example, the limit get and post. Add also the limit except get and post, the name for novel. This uh, says that the restriction access control to all the HTTP methods except to all ones specific above. Can um, it? The, with the limit except you are also uh, disabling anything that is not get post because if it's if it is get and po or post you would require a valid user but if it's it's not if it's not neither get nor post it would deny all and that's it that's how you can treat it from the HT axis itself Apache mode mode allow methods this is an experimental mode. Um, Basically, it restricts only to the HTTP methods that can be used on the server. It's important to say that it's case sensitive and was written to replace the current implementation of a limit and limit accept, but it's, it's experimental. experimental. If you are developer in your PHP code, you will check for example, the PHP out user, and then you must to check, for example, server request method and see um, if use get or post, you will be only pro, um, process, re, uh, accept the request. If you have another one, you will say, uh, you will show a error message. That is to prevent the the default fallback from a, from PHP, you can process it through the to the first, uh, through the filters, and if PHP detects it's not neither get nor post, it would disallow the, the connection. Okay, um, and works is not enough to declare the traditional HTTP method. You must to restrict the access to to those methods unknown or unwanted. Um, you must to to do the perform necessary security checks. Okay. What is our roadmap? Uh, of course, the tool has been written in Python, so it's open source. Uh, the tool has already been published. Now we'll give you the link so you can download it. Uh, it's also uh, going to be run on, of course, anything that runs Python, Windows, Mac. Linux, whatever, and it's going to be in the next versions of uh, Matrix and Samurai. You will be able to uh, find them, the tool there. And what is the roadmap? The, our next release is going to be the 1.0, which includes the link scanner that we have shown uh, during the demo, and it will also include the uh, remote file inclusion, local file inclusion, and SQL injection. That would be next month on our site. Now you can download the version that 
0.7. It's a beta version that works. That works perfectly fine. You can download it now and try it on. And we're working to integrate the tool with either Metasploit for gel injection and Map for detection of other directories, uh, other servers, uh, other web services in other ports and doing a more horizontal growth of the tool. Right now, from the root, for each directory, it does a subdirectory and so on and so forth for each and every file of the directory. And uh, with the new integrations on the, on the newest version, we will be able to uh, cross it with an Nmap result and get different web services from the same IP address and also uh, robots.txt detection. So it will maybe look more like a Pwn H tool. So we don't want that, but we're working hard on not making it look like a Pwn H tool. But it will try to we will try to integrate it with Nmap and Metasploit for gel injection. But we, will all, we already have developed these modules, and they're working, but the, the code is still a little bit dirty and patchy, so we won't uh, publish it for the next month. But you can now download um, the version uh, 0 0.7 beta from t -t -t this URL, mkit.com.ar slash labs slash htexploit. Uh, you can download it right now. It's published before our talk. So these are the references from all the research that led to this tool. We haven't found any tool that did this before our investigation, so we decided to make a new one. Uh, so if you find one, maybe you can email us with that tool. Maybe we can cross-reference and see how to improve our tool. Or we can stop our investigation altogether because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. But uh, we haven't found one. So these are all the references for the investigation that led to our tool. So questions? Any questions? Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. The, the fallback that allows you to get the files, it's a, a flaw in how PHP is developed. But it's not a, it's not a, pa it's not a fault that has a CVE that mm -hmm. needs a patch. You won't see a patch. Actually, this vulnerability is very old. It's old, old. And uh, there hasn't been a patch. Um, Apache, you can upgrade it to the newest version. PHP also, it's not a, it's not a patch requiring uh, vulnerability. It's a weakness in configuration. It's a mis misconfiguration. If you go and add limit accept to your HT access, that's it. So anything that uses HT access with PHP is vulnerable. Not IIS, but everything that uses HT access, if you have PHP behind. Yes? No, it's OS independent. If you install Apache on a Windows mm -hmm. server, it will explo exploit it. Yeah. We're good. We're good? Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Woohoo! All right. And everyone's eager to go on the next talk, so we'll do this fast, keep everything on time. Uh, so we're going to talk about lib injection today. And if you're looking to uh, follow along, you can go to this website. The slides are somewhere down there. And you can check it out. OK, who am I? I'm one of the directors of engineering at Etsy. Etsy is an online marketplace. Uh, my, my specialty is sort of enterprise-related features, fraud, security, email infrastructure, fun. So what I'm going to talk about is a C library, which is actually easy to port to other languages. And my previous sort of embedded C library is actually used um, in just about every ad server in the world. It's used in the Chrome browser. It's also open source, so you can check that out as well. But just to give you some background on development. OK, so next 14 minutes, we're going to go through like why detecting SQL injection is hard uh, and why certain other algorithms and methods don't work very well. Um, we're going to talk about the algorithm that is sort of newly developed and produced here and uh, the results, and then some next steps on how to move forward with it and use it in your application or to develop new tools from it. All right, so it actually turns out detecting SQL injection from user input is a hard problem. And the reason is uh, it's really easy to get started with regular expressions. It's like, hey, it's just a union all thing. And I know at least two open source web firewalls use this, and seen from the exploits done uh, and the workarounds done, it looks like a number of the commercial ones do it as well. The faults sort of indicate they're not really 
Um, they're too trivial that there must be regular expressions. Uh, so SQL is also huge. Um, if you ever sort of looked at it, the actual spec from 92, which you can sort of download, it's 600 pages of plain text just describing how it works. The 2003 spec, just the BNF form, is 128 pages. Um, no one does it exact, and everyone has like extensions and things uh, associated with it. It's a really big language. It's also Turing complete, so basically you can go write web servers just using SQL and, and things like that. Just using regular